welcome to the SEG webinar as part of our webinar series, Geophysics for Today and Tomorrow. The title of our webinar today will be Machine Learning, Predicting Hydrocarbon Production Data, and will be presented by Irina Martin. Irina Martin recently completed a master's degree in data science from Sussex University in the United Kingdom. She has spent the bulk of her career as a program manager for Schlumberger Research and Software Development for seismic depth imaging, including earth model building and seismic reservoir characterization. Irina has a PhD in seismic depth imaging and initiated a depth domain inversion as opposed to the time domain inversion for re reservoir characterization from Total and Institut Francois de Petrol. I enjoy, and she enjoys connecting domains that are previously disjointed. So without further ado, um, Irina, please uh, take us away with your wonderful presentation. Yes, thank you, Laurie. Um, good afternoon, Europe, and good morning, uh, America. Today I'll be speaking uh, about uh, machine learning, and how to predict hydrocarbon production data. Sorry, so my I have a laptop and uh, I need to look at my screen for this information. So I will be using uh, uh, the Volve from Equinor and Texas Railroad Commission uh, production data. Uh, Equinor has disclosed quite a lot of information and I'm using um, the Volve for um, oil and gas production, uh, water production and uh, um, water injection. And Texas Railroad Commission uh, uh, consolidates uh, information for oil and gas and I will be showing you uh, this information later on. So first I will be talking about Volve and Texas hydrocarbon geological structure and production data. Then I'll be speaking about uh, machine learning architecture and best practices. Then I'll be detailing the prerequisites and workflow for IRIMA and OSTM, which are the uh, two Python algorithms that I have implemented here. Then I'll be discussing the results for Volve and Texas. And then, unfortunately, I wasn't able to complete uh, these studies. So there is some future work that could have been done. So Volve hydrocarbon geological structure, in 1993, uh, an exploration was uh, drilled and found uh, oil in the uh, Jurassic sandstone. On the left, on the right side, you can see the same 2D structure now in 3D. And you can see here that the oil and gas reservoir are um, um, the oil and gas reservoir formation and uh, from the original well there are two additional wells that have been drilled to exploit the oil and gas now if you go to this those two um uh information you can retrieve an overview of the uh, equinor uh information about the uh, continental shelf platforms and uh, the Volve field data. Now, um, if you use this website, you'll have to register. And uh, <clears throat> I have used the production data and the reports, but you can have uh, geophysical interpretation, geosciences, Geosize Archive, Reservoir Model in Eclipse and RMS, Seismic Data, um, 4D Data, 4D Seismic, 
uh, seismic VSP, well logs, well logs per well, well technical data, and real time drilling. So you have to go to this website, register, and then you can have access to all those information. Now, the volume production data has been discovered in 1993, but not developed until 15 years later. Most of the production came in the first two, three years, and most of the information is about oil. There is a, a little bit of gas, a little bit of natural gas liquid, and very small information about condensate. Uh, this field is very small. It produced 63 million barrels of oil. So this is really very small by most standard with a peak of 56,000 barrels per day. Now going to Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico has uh, been formed about uh, 300 million years ago as a result of plate tectonics. Here what you are seeing is the Gulf of Mexico counties and there are hundreds of terabytes of exploration data mostly imaged in the uh, depth imaging domain using anisotropy. Here are two uh, a 2D section and a 3D section uh, generated by Schwabergie West and Gico. On the left side, you can see uh, the uh, uh, subsalt sediment area trapped by the basal salt. Sometimes it's also trapped by the flanks. And uh, here you have the, um, uh, the a similar view in 3D. Uh, on the left side and on the right side, you have the same uh, information, namely the uh, seismic data overlaid with the uh, seismic velocities, and the red is the highest velocity for the salt. Same here. Now, the Texas had carbon geological structure on shore uh, is also reported by the same Texas Railroad Commission. Here I have depicted the Permian Basin and the Eagle Ford shell, but in addition you can have the uh, Barnett shell, granite wash, hence the Bozier shell information. and provides information about oil and gas in separate here, separate information. So here I'm uh, showing a subset of the data from 1935 to 1945 for the oil production onshore and offshore. And here is the gas production onshore and offshore between the same time period. If you click on these um, links, you can have the uh, estimate of the crude oil production since 1935. And this is the gas production for the same period up to uh, 2018. This is what I have used for my uh, dissertation. Now we have seen the Volve and Texas hydrocarbon geological structure and production data. Now we are, are moving to machine learning architecture and best practices. So machine learning methods are a way of emulating human knowledge for training and prediction based on a similar way to the nervous system using nerve cells or neurons. So here you have the credit assignment problem in, uh, in our brain, and you have the uh, primary sensory area, which is the input, 
uh, you have a hidden layer with the higher sensory area. And then you have the output, or either as a motor output area or associative concept area. So the um, credit assignment is trying to assess the weight uh, from uh, the behavioral effects of changes to these synaptic connections or dendrites. And then uh, back propagate the information uh, up to, uh, until the um, uh, learning has been completed. Now you see the, see the same architecture here where you have uh, input layers with three type of information, the weights, the weights and again the weight and the bias input. So every time you use a machine learning architecture, there is a weight for each uh, input data and the sum is, is done. each neuron uh, and iterate backwards from the last layer to the to avoid redundant calculation of intermediate steps. So you have to perform this loop many many times until the weights are uh, optimized and you get the final uh, output. It's also interesting to see Alan Turing uh, about the B-type unorganized machines. And here I have depicted his um, first uh, proposal for this type. There are multiple machine learning techniques First one is the supervised. It's a labeled information and they are used for classification and regression. Uh, here I have selected two random forest and support vector machines. So this is a confusion matrix. Uh, the actual labels were for sunny and not sunny 1953. Once the random forest has been computed, then there is an increase in the sunny and not sunny information. Now, I don't know if you can see the uh, uh, so the first uh, um, Perceptron was created by McCulloch and Pitts as a logical calculus of the ideas immanent in nervous activity. And here we have a classification of two of the blood, blue dots versus the green dots. And in the middle, you have the weight with the input minus the bias equals zero. So this is a classification problem. And then you have the weights, the input minus the bias equal one, and the weight minus with uh, com, uh, multiplied by the input minus bias equal minus one. So this was the first perceptron and Later on, in 1992-1995, uh, Bozer, Isabel Guillon, and Pavlin uh, proposed a way to create nonlinear classifier by applying their input to high-dimensional feature space. The second technique is an unsupervised technique. 
Uh, so those information are not labeled. For example, you can have um, cats, dogs, uh, squirrels, and they could use k-means clustering for classification. The third category is uh, semi-supervised, which are a mixture of uh, labeled and unlabeled data. And uh, finally, the reinforcement learning, which learns from interaction between multiple player and performs a trial and error search. This was uh, proposed by Sutton and Barto uh, for the AlphaGo. And you, the framework is you start from a state situation ST. Uh, the agent is one of the player, uh, maybe you, and uh, there is an action, and the environment is a second player or an environment, and you create a next um, uh, state or situation, ST plus one, and the most important part is the reward because you have to uh, win the game. So the environment, uh, you are the, the player, but you don't know what the second player will do and how it will react. So there's, this is uh, the trial and error search. Now, for machine learning best practices, there are four type of information that you need to consider. So you have to define a business statement, understand your data, select the appropriate algorithm for the objective, and then deploy the uh, information. Now, to define a business statement, you either have to go to the marketing and sales department, use data analyst or data scientist to understand um, the business uh, needs for the stakeholders, and then you have to provide the success criteria. Uh, for understanding your data, the data collection is critical, so sometimes it's perform automatically, sometimes, sometimes manually. So you have to do an exploration data analysis and provide statistics and graphs. Uh, sometimes you need to pre-process the data. For example, remove not a number, use normalization. Uh, if you have huge amount of data, you have to use um, uh, reduction of dimensionality, for example, uh, PCA or K-means. And then you have to really understand uh, what is important in your data. For machine learning, uh, data has to be consistent. So you have to present the data in the same format. And then you can specify if the features are labeled unlabeled or semi-supervised. Now, um, there are lots of algorithms uh, out there. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. Here I will be presenting uh, two codes that I have used. Uh, you have to check if um, they are good algorithms that serve your purpose or they are not good. Then you have to train the data according to the objective and preserve some data for prediction. In my case, I used 90% uh, of the data for training and the last 10% for the prediction. Um, the accuracy and training time are related. Most of the uh, machine learning algorithms are are using linearity, 
sometimes they use uh, other parameters for and series vectors, matrices, and graph. So you have to optimize uh, this information for your objective. Once you have selected the appropriate algorithm, you have to provide training for the users, test and set deployment criteria, and automate deployment. In my case, I uh, am trying to predict future hydrocarbon production data, although I have the data uh, from the beginning to the end. And as I said, I'm, uh, I'm just predicting the last 10% of the hydrocarbon production data, and I will select the appropriate algorithm for that. Uh, to understand your data for the volume, I had to, I spent two to three weeks to remove duplication to clean the data. And uh, then I provide statistics and graph. And for uh, Volvo in Texas, those are label data belonging to the supervised techniques. And for LSTM, I had to normalize the data between zero and one as a good practice for uh, machine learning. Next, I analyzed the ARIMA and LSTM. Uh, I compare and contrasted the prerequisite workforce and associated algorithm. And then I, uh, I'll show you the conclusion for my uh, dissertation. And then of course, you have to provide training for the algorithm that are meeting the objective. Employee product champion and user for alpha and beta testing and automate deployment. Now I'll be detailing the machine learning prerequisite and workflows for ARIMA and LSTM. So ARIMA is the autoregressive integrated moving average and is based on an extension of the ARMA models. And there are stationary stochastic processes made of two polynomials. The RFP, which is the autoregressive model, contains a, a constant. Uh, phi i are the parameters between 1 and p. And you can see here that for determining xt, you need the information that happen beforehand and this is the white noise. So p is an evolving variable of interest regressed on its own lag prior value. The predictor should not be correlated and should be independent of each other. The second polynomial is the moving average and is q. And again, Q depends on the uh, uh, expectation of X, XT, the Y noise, and the uh, parameters of uh, the, uh, sorry, the parameters of the uh, regressor uh, theta i from 1 to q. q is a regressor uh, of linear combination of error terms whose values occur contemporaneously the previous time in the past. Now there is uh, an integrated uh, part here which is added, which is the term d and it serves two purposes. One is to make the data stationary, which I'll be showing you in the next slide. And it also is added for the optimization of the goodness of it 
between the model and the simplicity of the model. You, here you can use two uh, criterions. One is the archive information criterion or the Bayesian information criterion can also be used to select the model based on the likelihood of function and it includes AIC. Now the prerequisite for ARIMA, the data has to be stationary. Here you see a, a production data shows a high variability. If you remember the, uh, at the beginning we had a lot of information and then it declines towards the end. Now the autocorrelation shows that the production data is not stationary here. Uh, this part is stationary, but this part is not. So for my dissertation, I use the difference in the order one uh, for to make the production data and time series stationary. This means that you have to difference the order one moves a series with one additional step and performs the difference between the original time series and the one moved by one step. So what happens is that the first value is a, not a number because you, you move the, uh, the data with one, one uh, step and it becomes quasi-stationarity. Now the workflow. So here I have trained 90% of the production data and here I'm showing the uh, uh, last 10% uh, based on a function that calls predict. Uh, is function predict. So the uh, blue line is the actual value of the uh, production data and the uh, red part is the prediction. Uh, here I have generated multiple PDQ uh, from 0 to 4 for IRMA modeling and then I selected the PDQ with minimum AIC information criteria. So what happens is that <clears throat> the ARIMA modeling for P equal 3, T equal 1, and Q equal 1 uh, has the mean square error been reduced. However, the prediction doesn't follow the, uh, the real data, as you can see here. Um, now, the uh, uh, same thing happens here. Uh, there is a slight bend here, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, <coughs> get closer to the actual data. And here you can see the, um, the code. If you go to Club Research Go uh, Drive and you can input this code, you will uh, <coughs> have the same information as I have myself. Uh, so, machine learning methodologies have been invented in uh, by Bain and James in 1873 and James in 1890 to produce interactions among neurons within the brain. Um, <coughs> there are a couple of methods that can be used to uh, for time series. One is the artificial neural network by McCulloch and Pitts. Uh, the recurrent neural network 
and if you, if you remember uh, the objective is was to back propagate until the learning is stabilized with various weights the recurrent neural network are a class of ANN using the uh, a dynamic behavior and can handle additional storage feedback loops and the principle is the same you can also use convolutional neural network and here you can see the original data the multi-frequency uh, smoothing and the multi-scale downsampling you have a local convolution stage and a full convolution stage and then you can predict the label distribution for me i use the lstm which is a good methodology that can uh, handle the low level of granularity of the production data and there is an advantage with the gap length which is an enhancement from the uh, recurrent neural network where you don't need to have um, time sample at the same space So uh, for this information, I use Google Collaboratory. You can have this, uh, uh, the, <coughs> the uh, uh, link here. And the, uh, because it contains two important information, one is the TensorFlow backend and the Keras a Deep Learning Library. Now, if you look at the architecture, you can see that each uh, neural network is four, low, four layers in each module. Uh, what's important here is that the activation function used by um, TAN H uh, doesn't uh, provide. Uh, a vanishing gradient because there are additional gates and uh, uh, so uh, the uh, LSTM doesn't suffer from uh, the vanishing gradient however LSTM can suffer from the exploding gradient where the results are very close to infinity <coughs> Uh, same thing for LSTM, the workflow. You have to read the data for the production data, compute statistics, and display the original data, which is what I'm showing here for the all in Texas. Then you have to train the data according to the objectives. Here I train 90% of the data and left. 10% for the prediction. You have to read the data and search the value for the production. Use a function that generates an array for TensorFlow backend. Normalize between 0 and 1 is a best practice for machine learning. Split the data into training and testing for the final prediction and reshape the train and test data set into sample, time sample, time steps, and feature to make a 3D uh, dimensional array for the TensorFlow backend. Back then <coughs> the second part of the workflow is to create an LSTM modeling using TensorFlow backend and Keras library. So here you can see that the original data is in blue, the training data is in orange, and the predictions are in, in green. So you have to create an LSTM network using sequential modeling 
and train the model, uh, providing linear stack of layer. The training layers will use inference to adapt to the shape of the input data. Then you have to configure the learning process, convert to a dense format, which is a linear activation implement an operation where the activation is the element wise activation function passed to the kernel uh, as a weight matrix created by the hidden layers and the bias vector created by the layer and then compile the code using an optimizer called Adam. Uh, feed the train data for the prediction, the prediction using two argument epoch and batch size of one and compute the mean square error uh, which should decrease for the prediction compared to the training. And then display the result here. The result have been shifted for uh, <coughs> display purposes. Uh, now you can see the code. It's uh, uh, from this website. Now the result for the uh, Wolven in Texas. So uh, this is the result for the uh, Wolven in information. Here you can see the uh, LSTM for the monthly water production and prediction and for the gas production and prediction. As you can see, the training is really uh, the last part of the prediction here. I have trained 90% of the data and you can see the same shape uh, here. Unfortunately, the, this is the real data in blue and the predictions are in red and they do not really match. If you go, uh, if you do an ARIMA modeling with P4D2Q1, the mean squared error has increased. So the area here is larger than here. For the daily gas production and prediction, you can see the uh, last part of the 10% uh, uh, of the data. Uh, after the training, the, uh, this is the real data and the uh, predictions are uh, <coughs> not following at all the, the real data. Uh, once I have modeled uh, ARIMA with P4 and D1Q2. The mean square there has decreased. Unfortunately, it doesn't follow the, the real data, like here. Now, LSTM and ARIMA results for Texas. Here I use the uh, yearly oil production and yearly gas production. Same thing, uh, the real data is in blue, the training is in orange, and the predictions are in green. Same thing here, the real data is in blue, training in orange, and prediction in, in green. All, all those data have been shift, shifted for uh, to display the information. Now, if you can see the uh, prediction here, this is the real data after training 90% of the information and the predictions are in red. They do not follow the real data. Uh, after modeling with P4D2Q1, 
Q1, the mean squared there has decreased, but it doesn't follow the real data. Uh, for the uh, Texas gas production, uh, the training has been done for 90% of the data. And uh, again, it, the prediction doesn't follow the, the uh, <coughs> uh, real data. And then after modeling with D3, D2, and Q3, the mean square error has increased, which is not what sh should happen because uh, once the modeling has been done for a remark, the uh, mean squared error has to decrease. So as a conclusion, LSTM is following very closely the shape of the entire hydrocarbon production data. The training uh, for, I have trained 90% of the Boulder and Texas data, and the training is matching closely the hydrocarbon production data, which helps the learning significantly. When, when I use the modeling with LSTM, via TensorFlow back backend and Keras library, uh, the predictions are very close to the final 10% of the data. And even after shifting the data. While ARIMA has difficulties in following the entire hydrocarbon production data, I trained 90% of uh, the data, and as you have seen, uh, the, um, the last 10% of the data were not following the, uh, the, the real data. Even if uh, I have uh, created multiple PDQ from zero to four, uh, sometimes ARIMA uh, increases the mean squared error, which is, should not happen after ARIMA modeling. So the prediction in this uh, with ARIMA are not very good. So as a success criteria, I established that LSTM is the best algorithm for the hydrocarbon production data and I will be selecting this one for <coughs> training and testing. So um, unfortunately, I was very close to the, the end of my dissertation and um, I wasn't able to upload uh, a couple of libraries. Here you can see the uh, the value in orange and the forecast in blue. And uh, those library, I was not able to upload them um, due to uh, a short time frame. So <clears throat> this is the, um, uh, if I would have had time to do that, I would have probably uh, made ARIMA much better and following the, uh, uh, this information. So this is the, uh, uh, thank you for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Irina. This is Lori. Um, thank you all for attending. And if you have questions, you can either raise your hand in the webinar interface, or you could just enter your question into the question and answer box or the chat box. All right, we have one question. And it, it showed that uh, the question is, can you clarify um, your predictive results, they seem to be op almost opposite 
of the actual production data. So there was some confusion. Uh, you mean here? Yes. Right, so uh, <coughs> if you see the, um, the information on LSTM, uh, it's very close to the, the final 10% of the data. Uh, it's a, a, a steeper curve. Uh, in this case, uh, the mean squared error has decreased, but sometimes, like in here, mm. uh, the mean squared error has increased, which should not happen after modeling. Uh, with ARIMA, uh, everything should decrease, the mean squared error should decrease. Uh, same thing for this information for the monthly water. Yeah, the this this was actually the slide that uh, they had confusion on. All right, so you, you are training 90% of the data. Here you are showing. Uh, here I'm showing the uh, real production data, and the predictions are not really following. Uh, here maybe it's a little bit closer, but here it doesn't match the production data. And once um, <coughs> the modeling with Arima has been produced the mean squared error has increased uh, because the area between the uh, real data and the prediction has grown up. Same here, same here. It, when you have uh, daily gas production, which is this part, the less than percent, the um, prediction do not follow the um the the real production data and it goes up here it uh, the mean square error has decreased but it still doesn't follow the the production data all right thank you um, we have another question. Can we see the data structure, i.e. labels? Um, and I'm not sure exactly where. Um, the labels? Uh, so, um, no, I don't have the labels. Uh, those methods are both uh, for Volve and uh, uh, Texas uh, production or uh, oil and gas production, they are supervised techniques. So I don't have a uh, maybe no, I don't have uh, information about the features, but they have been uh, every information contains the. Uh, um, time series for uh, oil and gas and water production and water injection and for uh, uh, Texas the same thing for oil and gas and it has a time series um, uh, which is um, uh, labeled information about that time series and then you have a in the second column you have the uh, oil and gas production and this is the information that i have used uh, for uh, the um, production data all right well thank you um uh, maybe I can show you the um, the code. Um, no, uh, uh, maybe not yet. Uh, there's another question. Um, uh, can you uh, tell 
whether the relative amount of data in the two cases, Valera versus Texas, is similar, or if one of them contains more data and no. uh, the amount of data matters. Yeah, so the worldly data contains much more information because you have the monthly water, uh, the monthly um, oil and gas production, monthly water production, and monthly uh, water injection to displace the um, uh, oil and gas. And for, um, uh, it, for the Volvo, you also have the daily gas, the daily oil, the daily gas, the daily water injection, and the daily um, water uh, injection for Volvo. So, unfortunately, uh, so this is the data that I have had to clean quite a lot. It took me two to three weeks to, to clean the data. And for uh, Texas, uh, the Royal World Commission is um, consolidating all the information into yearly in, uh, information about oil and gas. So I didn't do anything for Texas because the, it was already um, consolidated by the Texas Railroad Commission. But for Volve, I had to uh, sum up all the information that were related to the same time series. So I have, I have spent a lot of time to clean the data. Thank you, Rina. I think I think that's a very common problem uh, in the in the industry that there's a lot of data. We have a we are very rich uh, uh, in data uh, industry, but it's not very well organized. Sometimes in some companies, most of them have status. It is hard to even find the data. Uh, plus, it has to be clean, label, etc. And that's one of, of our biggest challenges. And it's, I'm glad you mentioned this. I have one question. Yes. Uh, just, you just trained, uh, sorry, let me start again. You used 90% of your data for training in both cases. Uh, yes. Was this because your, your business goal or your success criteria was to be able to predict that final 10% or was this an arbitrary norm, number or did you just, did you test other percentages of training data uh. versus prediction? No, so for Arima, you have to do quite a lot of work uh, to uh, um, uh, retrieve the information uh, about the prediction. So you have uh, so you have the the blue lines here, which are the real production data, but to create this yellow line. I had to work quite a lot and retrieve information that was not um, that I had to predict uh, uh, by um, uh, <laughs> inferring. Um, um, uh, sorry, I I had to uh, create. Um, um, a lot of um, information to recreate the uh, the uh, red line, and here you can see that um, it doesn't follow the the training data at all. I can show you the code if you want, but. Um. I, I sure. I think we still have uh, a few minutes. Uh, if if there is something relevant in the code that you would like to to, to show.
Sorry, it takes a while until it loads the, the entire code because it's a, it's a huge amount of data. This is open source code then? Yes. Uh, so I have uh, provided the information for uh, uh, I provided the information for the code. Yes. Yes. So uh, for the final results, you can see here that I had to uh, create a prediction for the forecast, and then I had to display the um, NP array, and I had to do that by hand. Uh, and this is the um, uh, the uh, information and. Yeah, so here I had a, a problem of, um, well, let me just show you something else. So this is how you uh, create a multiple PDQ. So it, it goes from zero, zero to uh, four to zero. And then for the prediction of ARIMA, I had to create uh, this information by hand. So uh, that's why I used only 10% of the data. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is the original value and then the test. And uh, yeah, here I had, um, some issues with the information. That's why I uh, only uh, checked only 10% of the data. No, but that's reasonable. And of course, this is yes. part of your thesis work, so yes. yeah. Well, thank you very much. And it's very nice to see that uh, you're also sharing the code in case somebody wants to try it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you have the, you know, you have the code uh, for LSTM here and for ARIMA here. Uh, this code is not, you know, you have to add uh, some additional library that I was not able to um, uh, provide in the last three days of my dissertation, but if you add uh, the additional libraries, it's probably Arima will perform much better. Great. How are we doing on time, Lori? Well, we're actually right on time, so we should be uh, closing up uh, shortly. And uh, we'll give a last call for questions. Uh, and if we don't have any additional questions, we should probably uh, call it a day. All right, I see no additional questions. So uh, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Irina, for a very interesting presentation. Um, thanks for sharing all of your data with the world. Uh, and I'd like to uh, say uh, have a great new year, everybody, and uh, look forward to this webinar being posted on the SEG YouTube channel shortly. And in 2020, please look forward for our social media posts for our other uh, upcoming webinars.